Watching that video, the jury is seeing video of that spy camera aimed at the box where the son was made to live. Uh, right now, he is in the room in the dark, as we understand it, per the courtroom notes from Grace Wong, our courtroom coverage director. Our Julia Janae is live in Florida, been covering this trial from the start, and she is watching on a video feed exactly what the jury is seeing. Uh, Julia, tell us, please, uh, what you can see in that video. Julie, the lights have just now come on, and what we're seeing is the son, the Farrader's son, he's putting on clothes, taking off clothes, changing his shirt, moving things around the room, and it really emphasizes for this jury, and I'm sure the state wants to emphasize this for them, that he lived out his daily life here, that this is where he was day in and day out doing regular things that kids would do, but they would be inside the home with the rest of their family. They'd be able to come and go. And you get a sense of that watching him just not talking to anyone, not interacting with anything, not really having anything seemingly to even stimulate his mind. But this is where he is putting on pajamas, taking off pajamas, getting ready for the day, making up his bed. He's in this room. So no doubt that's what they are doing in times like this where you're not seeing the arguments, you're not seeing him in the dark, but you are seeing him do these daily tasks inside of this eight by eight room. Oh, Julia, as you know, it's, it's so upsetting to just think about that this is the way that child is preparing for school. They give him a couple slices of bread, slap some peanut butter on it. There's your breakfast, kid. Eat it in the box where you don't have a sink to wash your hands or a proper toilet to use the restroom, a shower uh, so that he can, he can bathe uh, and be clean going to school. Uh, this is nothing short of appalling. Uh, and Julia, I think what we're learning throughout this trial is that room wasn't just a timeout room. As you said, this was this child's daily life. And that's what this four hours of video that the state planned to show today is really showing. We are showing those volatile moments or seeing those volatile moments between his parents and the child. What they're also seeing Julie constantly in the bottom right hand corner of this surveillance video is that orange Home Depot bucket. The one that they have heard over and over about that he was made to urinate and sometimes defecate inside of that uh, that bucket. He said that he only only urinated in it during the time that he was in Jupiter, Florida, because this abuse that is alleged in the indictment is only for the six weeks. But he constantly used that even when he was in Arizona, he was given a bucket. And Julie, just to let you know, the lights are now off inside of the room again. So this is nighttime for him, day in, day out. Oh, Julia, it's hard to even think about. And the child is told he's not allowed to turn the air conditioning on. Uh, and if he does, he gets in trouble, he gets screamed at, and Florida is sweltering. I mean, think about all of the trials that you cover in Florida. I'm sure it's very hot where you are outside right now, my friend. Think it's about this right now. Gosh. It yeah. It's hot right now. My hair's getting frizzy from the humidity now. <laughs> uh, but. Th that is a constant concern and when you think about someone in the garage it seems that they did understand that that would be an issue is why they had the man who constructed this um, putting that air conditioned box in there but right now again it's dark inside of that room he's wrapped up in the sheets on his bed and this is his life essentially and it seems like he is about to go to sleep or maybe is sleeping in the video, according to the notes that I'm seeing, Julia. And it makes you wonder how a child can even sleep and rest peacefully under those circumstances. He doesn't seem to be sleeping peacefully. I will say that, Julie. There's a lot of tossing and turning that we're seeing. There's some getting up and readjusting the sheets so that he can then try and sleep again. So it does not, it does not seem to be um, a very peaceful sleep at the moment that I'm seeing in court right now. Mm. And the jury is seeing all of this. They're seeing him changing, Julia. I'm getting word from our team there that the jury's seeing him urinating in the bucket. You know, what a degrading thing for the jury to have to see this because of the Farrader's decision to go to trial. Oh, wow. And actually, I'm seeing that now. I'm watching him go and get that orange bucket. His dad came in, and he then went, turned on the light. 
he went to his son went to the orange bucket so it seems like there may have been a discussion like that's what you need to come and take out and he had to take his own bucket out of that room so this 14 year old child is told to take that bucket out of the room and now we're just seeing the door open and he's gone so we understand from what the prosecution has said in this case that he was made to throw it out in the backyard himself clean out that bucket and was told apparently that um, you know don't let the neighbors see you but right now we're just seeing that empty room right now with the door open. Julia, I wanted to ask you about the neighbors. It's hard to imagine them not seeing this box constructed in the Ferreter garage, existing in the garage, the child going to and from, disposing of his own waste. Uh, has there been any evidence about any neighbors getting suspicious of the Ferreter home? Uh, Julie, I just want to let you know that he did come back into the room with that orange bucket, and now it looks like the door is about to be closed again. Yep, there goes the door. Door closed again. So now that he's cleaned that up and his dad was there to tell him, take that out, and now he's back in with the door closed, and we can presume, according to what the state has said, that the door is now locked behind him. Julia, did the neighbors notice anything suspicious? Uh, not that we know of yet. Nothing that's come into evidence that the neighbors noticed anything suspicious or that they shared anything with police. Only the man who constructed this structure, he felt uneasy about it and did contact police. Yeah, these, uh, these ferreters, they were sure stealth. Uh, Julia, it's so great uh, having you be able to watch what these jurors are watching and share it with us. Uh, you're going to continue doing that as we continue watching the videotaped evidence and listening to it live. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with more Court TV after this. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Judge Ashley, along with Julia Janae. The jury in Florida is viewing four hours of home surveillance videos in the Boy in a Box trial. The videos show what life was like for the defendant's adopted son. Now, remember, Court TV is not allowed to show the videos because the alleged juvenile is the victim in it is the alleged juvenile. But we can hear the audio. Defendant Tim Ferreter is charged with aggravated child abuse, false imprisonment, and child neglect for locking the child in a box-like structure in their garage, a structure that they had built. Julia, always great to be on with you. You're there live. Tell us what is happening in court right now. That's right. Four hours of video is what the state said that they were planning to show this jury today. We are several hours into it. And what we're seeing right now is what we've seen over and over again. This child victim putting on pants, putting on a shirt. This is his every day. We saw a screen that comes up, which lets the jury know what the time code is for this. So it's a date in January at 8.43 a.m. So he's starting his day. He's alone. He's inside of this room. He's folding up the clothes that he was wearing, and then he's putting on the next set of clothes so that he can start his day. It looks like, though, he, it, the door's locked because he's not going out at all. He's just there seemingly waiting for someone to come and unlock that door. All right, uh, Julia, I, the, this case is something else. I just have to mention primacy and recency. I think it's a pretty smart move by the state to have this, as, as I understand it, and fill us in, some of the last evidence they present to this jury. The last thing they're going to see is this, this feeling of being in the box with the victim. That's a great way to put it, Ashley, because it is taking them there. And once you've been watching it hours at a time in this quiet courtroom, it's as if you are living through these moments with them. And you're right. This is the end of their case in chief. We thought they were going to rest yesterday. That's what they told the court. But things ran a bit over. So this is expected to be what's either the very last or at least close in time to the last of them resting their case in front of this jury. Uh, and to let you know, as far as the video, he left the room. It seemed that his mom came in, said good morning. He left 
the structure that he stayed in all night and it looks like the lights are out now and so usually what happens at this point if he doesn't come back in is we're going to see a new title page that will tell these jurors what the date is what the timing of day is there it is 12 25 p.m so middle of the day and now he's back in the room uh, this is january we expect that this may be a school day, but it could be a weekend day. So he could be waking up, leaving the room, and then by lunchtime, he's back inside of the room. He's at his desk right now. And one of the other things I noticed, Julie, on the amazing notes our field team is giving us is that um, in, in one of these videos just played, you can hear the sound of a toddler's voice in the distance, which to me even highlights for the jury, guess what? Guess who's not inside this eight by eight room with no windows? The other children. The other children are not. And actually what we've learned through the opening statements in this case is that the reason that they first moved him into the structure was because they had a baby on the way and they wanted a baby room and there was not space for all four children to, it seems, have their own room. So they moved him out to the garage and gave the baby one of the rooms that was inside of the house. And there have been times on this surveillance video that we've seen the toddler come into the room uh, just in a cute little voice asking the dad, what is this and what is that? This is normal for them inside of this home. The child is there seeing what's going on, seeing that this is going to be the room that his brother is going to be in, but you don't uh, throughout the day see other kids in this room. So meaning you think about a room for kids, normally siblings are coming to play in the room with siblings. Even if they have separate rooms, they play with each other in the rooms. We're not seeing that happen. The only time I saw the toddler inside of the room is when the dad happened to be in there and seemed to be watching the toddler. Ugh, it is crazy. And there we see mom watching on. She gets to be there. These trials are separated. I'd like to just talk about moments ago, some of the other video that this jury watched. And again, as you pointed out, the date is high Highlighted. So we know this was January 15th of 2022. And Tim actually comes into this eight by eight room and the bucket that we've all heard about, Julia, he says to the child, is it dirty? And the answer is, yeah. And then the doors open and he, the father says, uh, neighbors don't need to see your blank bucket. When I say blank, it's a word we can't say on TV. And so, you know, he has to bring it back in. And then again, he asks about the bucket. Is it dirty? I mean, to me, it's just so fundamental to think that it's okay to have a bucket and say, oh, is it dirty now? And don't let the neighbors see it. To me, that indicates you know there's something wrong with this. You know there's a problem with the bucket being dirty and having him use a bucket that you don't even want the neighbors to see it, Julia. Oh, the state is absolutely emphasizing that. And we watched, I watched that moment, these jurors watched that moment of the child having to carry his own bucket of urine out of the room and then come back moments later with the same bucket to put it in the corner. And it's prominent in that video, even now where he's lying on the bed. It looks like he may have a book or may have that school order tablet that is the only thing he was permitted to have in the room. He's just laying on the side of the bed and you can still see that bucket. But you're right. The admission of don't let the neighbors see you, they want to really, as far as the state, emphasize that that shows that there was this admission or understanding that this was the, a wrong thing and they understood the guiltiness of what their actions were. Yeah. And, you know, we talk about some people online, people are talking, and some feel like this wasn't inappropriate, that there were behaviors by the boy that warranted this kind of treatment, that it's not abuse. But I go back to it's not a timeout in a room in the house, like you pointed out, where other kids can come and go, but rather it's an eight by eight, the lock on the outside. And something else in the video I wanted to ask you about that really bothers me is he is told, don't touch the air conditioning. Do I have to say it again and again and again and again? Don't ever touch it. I mean, it, again, he's in this room, and so maybe arguably there's air conditioning, but he can't touch it. The light switch is on the outside of the room, so he can't touch that. He can't unlock the door. These are the things to me that, in my opinion, make this abuse of a child. 
Uh, what we're seeing right now is him sitting on the edge of his bed, and they have ticked off the different times. So we saw 12, we saw 1, and now we're seeing 2 o'clock, and he's still there. So it may be that the state will keep showing you how even during the day, not just at night, just not when parents weren't around to be able to know what he was doing, but even during the afternoon hours that he is still inside of this room. And they've had to be careful about not taking up too much of the court's time, not dragging this trial out. So though they had thousands upon thousands upon thousands of videos, they had to pick the ones that are going to give the best depiction that will support their case against these parents. And just as a reminder, Julia, and I'm so appreciative that you've been there and watching all of this firsthand, can you um, describe the room? We've seen the pictures of the outside of it as it's being built, but tell us more about the inside of this room. And I would say a box, not a room. Sure, inside, you've got those four walls. They're painted white. The door is an adult-sized door, regular door that you would see in a home. When the parents come in, you know, they don't have to duck down. It's not any smaller than a normal bedroom door. They walk right in, and, and it takes up a lot of the room once that door is open because it's already a small area. It touches the bed, so when that door is open, the side of the door is hitting the side of that twin mattress that's in the rooms. So that gives you an idea of just how small this is. The twin mattress is up in the right-hand corner of the room. It's on the floor. There's been a back and forth of whether there's a box spring. There's definitely no headboard. There's definitely no legs, no frame of a bed. It is seemingly, from this vantage point, just a mattress. It has sheets on it. It has a comforter on it now again. And then next to the bed in the upper left-hand corner is a desk. And that's where sometimes we see him sitting. That's what he's doing right now is sitting at the desk that's in the upper left-hand corner. It's a small, maybe wooden desk. There were at one point some posters up on the wall, but we did see video of him taking some of those down. And the defense made sure to, to mention that in the highlights, uh, rather in the opening statements where they were highlighting things. And just to point out, 6.20 p.m., he's still in the box, Judge Ashley. This could be the day that he was in there 18 hours. But back to the de description of this room, we know that it has a concrete floor and there's a rug or carpet on the floor as well. Looks like it's a dark colored um, rug. And then you see the bucket. That's the only other thing, the orange bucket in the bottom corner at the foot of the bed inside of this space that if he lay down, there could only be two of him head to head on the length of this room. All right, and I love you and pointed out- not two out. of him going the other way. And I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm so sorry, Julie. I know you said at 620 still in the box. Let's go into court in moments ago. And again, this is some of the video. We can hear the audio. We can't show you the video because the young victim who's a juvenile is on that video. But Julia, as we're listening to this and what's being said, and you know, it's like they, it sounds to me like there's so many times where we're watching what the victim's doing that you've been describing, sitting, reading a book throughout this day. It's now 7.03 as I understand it. And they may enter and ask things or bring clothes, but overall he's in that, in there for that entire time. Yeah, we don't really see him leave at all, even for a break, even for food, even for the bathroom. Um, he, the lights are off now. So you mentioned 7.15 p.m., not really that late uh, in terms of what may be a teenager's bedtime, but the lights are off and he is laying there on the bed under the sheets already. 
And the other thing I noticed is when Tim or mom come in, they'll say, where are you going? Well, he doesn't go anywhere. He plops down on the chair. What are you doing? They have a quick chat. Every time they come in, they seem to say, what are you doing? Where are you going? Well, where can he possibly go and what can he really be doing? Because there's nothing in the room. He doesn't have devices. He doesn't have a computer. He can't leave the locks on the outside. So I feel like there's also an element of control and it goes back to that point for viewers of is it parenting control or is it abuse? And speaking of control, I have to bring up while we're looking at her on the screen, Julia, the wife, the mother of the child. So many viewers have said, why is she even in the courtroom? Well, we know if she's not being a witness and because she's out on bond, she can choose to be in the courtroom. But tell us your observations of how she and Tim, the father, husband, have acted when you've seen them in this courtroom. You know, even if she wasn't someone who was a co-defendant, even if we didn't have her picture, her mugshot, you would automatically know that this is the wife of the man who's on trial. They have not been shy about affection. They're inside of the courtroom. They're walking the hallways. Uh, the jury hasn't been made completely aware of who she is. The defense didn't point her out during their opening statement. They didn't have her get identified when the son was on the stand, but it's like clear to them because during sidebars Tim Ferreter will turn his chair around and slide up to where his wife is and they will have these private conversations and I think jurors likely at this point in the trial day four have put two and two together that this is the woman that we are seeing there in these videos all right and let's go back into court just moments ago I went to listen in as Tim the father the defendant is speaking to his son inside that box let's listen All right, we know that's at 7.03. He's saying to him, let's go take a shower. And again, he asks, and Julia he seems to do this every time he goes in there too, is your bucket clean? Yeah. So he knows he's given him that bucket for using the bathroom. Now, I had thought that there was some point that the defense said, you know, that wasn't necessarily a bucket given to go to the bathroom, but I may, I may be misremembering that. I, I remember during opening statements that the defense attorney said the one design flaw in this room and the room in Arizona was that it did not have indoor plumbing, it didn't have a bathroom. And that's why at night he had to use this bucket. So they did own not only that there was this problem with the room, but also that it wasn't the right idea. They've owned that uh, and said that he perhaps should have taken a different route, but it doesn't make it malicious, it doesn't make it a crime, but that they should have come up with a better method than this. But certainly that's part of the routine. Coming in, good morning, is there anything in the bucket? I mean, it, it's, it's, to quote the son on the stand, dehumanizing in a sense, to have someone who's having to carry out their own, their own bucket with their elimination overnight. I mean, it, it's just hard to fathom, and no doubt the jury is really going to have a tough time with this one.